And the thing that they kept screaming into the phone over and over and over again was how DoorDash was taking 30% of every transaction. Unless I find a solution to this, Adam, I don't think I'm going to make it. The number one and the number two customer acquisition sources that we see in restaurants, it is not Facebook, it is not Instagram, it is not TikTok. We're seeing that more and more restaurants across the industry are seeing their sales taken by DoorDash and Uber Eats. The most successful restaurants that were growing huge numbers we're focusing more on increasing. What do Marcus Lemonis from The Prophet, the DJ group, The Chain Smokers, and Kimball Musk, Elon's brother and a prolific restaurateur in his own right, all have in common? They all invested in today's guest, Adam Guild, founder of Owner.com. Five years ago, Modern Restaurant Magazine called Adam the revolutionary that was changing the face of restaurant marketing. In the years since, he's helped thousands of restaurateurs scale marketing and profits. And today he's sitting down with us to review the tactics, tools, and strategies that he's used to help restaurateurs level up. Adam, I'm so excited to chat with you today. I'm so excited to be here, Josh. I've been a long-term listener of the show, and there's so many different things that I'm excited to share with the audience that we've noticed across what all of the most successful independent restaurants do in common to grow their businesses. And the best part is that they don't require buying our platform. They don't require buying any expensive ads. They're often things that any restaurant owner can do once they understand them. I want to start at the beginning, which honestly isn't that hard considering the fact that you're only 24 years old, which is impressive considering the fact that this is a six-year-old company. And I want to go back to being 17. You decide to drop out of high school and take the entrepreneurial leap, which looking back was the right decision. But in that moment, I'm sure that you were wrought with fear and apprehension and uncertainty. So take me back to that moment, that decision and all of the context around it. You're right. I was wrought with fear when considering dropping out of high school because everybody in my life was telling me how this was going to be the worst mistake of my life, that I was giving away my future, that I was doing it for a very stupid reason. There's a chasm between Minecraft, right? Which is an online video game, something that you enjoyed, that you played and all of that to what you created with owner.com. Walk me through the transition from one to the other. It's been a crazy life to get here. And you're totally right. It could not seem more unrelated on the surface. So the story starts at 12 years old. And the reason it starts at 12 was that was the age that I actually started that Minecraft server. That Minecraft server was initially just supposed to be this hobby and this way to have fun and make friends online. But over the course of the next four years, it grew and grew and grew. And eventually, by the time I was 16 years old, it had grown to become one of the largest Minecraft server networks in the world, meaning that it reached over 7 million players and was starting to generate hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. That was when I made the decision to drop out of high school because I was miserable in school. Anytime I had a break, lunchtime, the, the break period, I would lock myself in this specific bathroom where I knew nobody would bother me and I would just focus on building my Minecraft server. And so eventually the Minecraft server started to take off. Um, it had definitely taken off by this point. And when it started to take off, meaning that it was making enough money to support me, I realized that I needed to focus fully on that and that I had to trust in God and in myself that things would work out if I, if I made that bold decision. So there's obviously a massive delta in between like building Minecraft servers and serving the restaurant industry, marketing tech. Um, how did you get from one to the other? I hated the fact that after I dropped out of high school, I was literally spending all day long trying to use those skills to make what I saw as a negative impact, meaning that I would spend all of my time building these games so that other people could waste theirs on my games so that I could make money. And while I needed to do that to make money at the time, because a, seven, a 16 year old high school dropout doesn't have that many options um, to monetize their skill set, And if they have a pretty profitable Minecraft server, it turns out to be a good one. Um, I was looking for a way to use that skill set to actually make a positive impact, but I wouldn't know what that way would be 
until I had this experience in helping grow my mom's business because I saw my mom start this business and feel really excited about it. And her first few customers absolutely loved her. It was a dog grooming business. And she created very quickly a cult following of a few regulars that thought that she had the highest quality service, that she couldn't be kinder as an owner, that her team was great. But where she struggled was in getting new customers because while she had a really loving base of customers, she happened to be on a quiet street. So she didn't have a lot of car traffic. She didn't have a lot of foot traffic. And she had tried spending thousands of dollars on various forms of online advertising, whether it's Facebook ads or Google ads or many of the others. She'd also tried offline marketing, direct mail, receipt ads. And even after spending thousands of dollars and months of her time, none of it was working to help her get new customers. So she started to reach a place where nothing was working that she was trying online. And she came to her weird, nerdy 17-year-old son at the time for help who had learned growth marketing in the gaming industry. And I started to take a look at what she was doing to market her business and trying to understand why it was that the Facebook ads or other forms of traffic to her website that she was buying weren't actually converting into new customers. And then I realized what the problem was and started to build a product around it. So I actually built the first version of owner for my mom's business. And then over the course of six months, I saw it completely transform her life. And now fast forward seven years and that dog grooming business is doing over a million dollars a year, which is a lot for a dog grooming business. It's like triple the average. It's a lot of dogs. Yes, <laughs> yes. And she's expanded into a larger location. And I've seen my mom's dreams come true when she finally had the right tools to succeed online. And when I saw that happen, when I was 17 in her, I realized that that was my calling, that I needed to build a business around helping people like my mom who just needed the right tools to succeed online because they already provided great services. I wanna go back to something you said earlier. Um, so you said that you know you looked at your mother's business and you realized what the problem is. There's a quote that I'm gonna butcher and it, it goes something to the effect of, if you can clearly articulate the problem that you have, you are most of the way to solving it. What was the problem? Clearly articulate the problem that your mother had. So when she went in to build her own website based on what she thought would be best for the business, it turned out that that wasn't what her customers thought would be best as a website and she didn't know it. So the term for this in marketing is conversion rate, meaning for every hundred people that visit a website, how many of them actually end up becoming customers after having visited sure. that website. So when she was buying thousands of dollars worth of advertisements on Facebook and Google and direct mail and receipt ads telling them all to grow to go to her website, they would go to her website, that part worked, but then when they visited the website, they wouldn't become new customers because something about the way my mom put that website together was not attractive to them. People have gotten really high standards for what they expect online and they're making snap judgments. So when I went in there and I saw that her conversion rate was under 1%, I realized that's why none of this ad spend was working and everybody was trying to pour more money into a leaky bucket through buying traffic from all these different channels versus first making sure that the bucket was fixed and then buying the advertisements. I had this conversation with restaurateurs all the time because I, I think the biggest thing we struggle with, and, and we're really going to unpack this a little later in the conversation, but it's intent. Mm -hmm. You get one shot. Nobody ever goes, oh, well, you know, we went to that restaurant last month. Let's check out their website and see if they've updated <laughs> anything. Like that's just not the typical use case. So it has to be incredibly compelling because typically the people that are on your website are looking to make a buying decision and they're looking to make it now. And I don't think most of us realize how high those stakes are. Exactly. There's a shocking statistic in the restaurant world, which is that the average website converts visitors at less than 2%, meaning that 98 people that visit the average restaurant's website out of 100 visit that website and then decide to go with another option, whether that's a competitive restaurant or going back to the search engine, Google or Yelp to figure out what other restaurant they might want to go to and, and continue the browsing process. And there's huge power 
in rather than 2% converting, the average, having 15% convert. Because it means that for the exact same amount of website visitors, you can have more than six times as many sales from that same input, which means that all of the dollars that you spend then on advertising get multiplied. So great. So you understand the problem, you understand the solution, but you're 17 and you have no money. And so that being the case, you're going to need to recruit other people into the business in order to have the financial means to compete with the big guys or the guys that I would say at that stage were becoming the big guys in the industry that were trying to create tailored solutions for our industry. And so you have massive names. And I, I'm sure it's really easy to say, oh, it's Kimball Musk and Chain Smokers and Marcus Lemonis. But what did it look like to enroll those people, especially at such a young age? For the first two and a half years of building this company, I never thought I'd be able to raise money because first of all, I didn't know raising money in technology companies was a thing. I just assumed that companies had to be profitable and use those profits to grow. That's the way I had done it with my Minecraft server. That's the way my mom was doing it. So I didn't realize that there was another way. And second of all, when I started to realize that raising money was a thing, I looked at all the people that were able to raise money from this latest generation of successful startup founders. And I saw all these examples of people that I thought had an easier time raising money because of their backgrounds. And that thought was probably true. So the internal narrative that I had was because I don't have a network, I don't know anybody in the tech industry, and because I'm a high school dropout that didn't even finish 10th grade, I won't have access to this money. And therefore, I have to build a business that can grow without it and actually be profitable. And we were for the first two and a half years. Then we reached a place where the company was so independently attractive to investors because of the success that our customers were seeing and their retention rates and the growth that we had seen even profitably that they started to come to us. And when that happened, people started asking us, what would it take to be able to invest in the company at this point? And there was two people that I really looked up to in the restaurant industry. Marcus Limones, because he's the star of The Profit on CNBC, and I'd grown up watching his show with my mom. It was what we used to do together. And so the idea of having him involved was like a dream come true. And so when the Chainsmokers, the music group, happened to be introduced by another investor that was trying to invest in our earliest round, they said, what would it take to get to invest now in this company? And I said, well, there's this one person that would be a dream come true to meet in Marcus because I've grown up watching his show. He's incredible. He owns dozens of restaurants. He owns hundreds of local businesses. Like having his advice and vision incorporated in this business would be huge. What ended up happening was they networked to Marcus Lamonis and like their celebrity network or whatever. And then I did a call with Marcus and he's like, Adam, I love your vision here. This is something that I've wanted to see in so many of the local businesses that I've helped, a simple way to succeed online. I would love to be involved. I'll invest whatever amount you want up to a million dollars and would love to see where this goes because I really believe in the vision and I believe in you as a person. The fact that you've gotten this far without having all of these credentials means that I think you're going to go much further. And so that's when he invested and I started to ask him for advice on how I should shape the platform. So Marcus Lamonis, prolific entrepreneur and restaurateur, but he's not the only guy you're working with. You've also gotten investment from and worked directly with Kimball Musk, Elon's brother. Talk to me about how that took place and what that relationship has been like. Kimball Musk has been a godsend to this business because the idea that he would take time out of his life, like days of time to help this 20 year old kid that had no connections and knew nobody speaks volumes to his character. And I was like living in a fantasy in this situation. Like as somebody that never thought I'd be able to raise venture capital because I'm a high school dropout that knew nobody in tech, this idea that investors would be asking me, who can we get involved so that we can invest was like completely foreign and felt like a dream that I was in. But there were two names I gave and you said Marcus Lamotis was one. The other was Kimball Musk because I knew that he had deep experience in the technology world from having built Zip2 
for years and then sold it for $300 million, but that he also had now a decade of experience of building his own restaurants. And that was really exciting to me because I knew that somebody that came from the tech industry would think about restaurants slightly differently than somebody that came from the restaurant industry. And I wanted to learn what it was that he'd figured out. So that investor very graciously offered to introduce him to us. They knew him from having made another investment together. And I was very nervous for this call. I was like <laughs> feeling such imposter syndrome for this guy even like hopping on a call with me. And he didn't love it at first. He was like, I don't think restaurants really need this. And when I heard that, my heart was broken because I was like, how could restaurants not need this? We've got all these restaurant customers that are loving it. How could he think this? And as I learned more about what he was saying, it was that his restaurant didn't need this because he'd spent millions of dollars developing his own internal version of it, literally hiring teams of software engineers to connect his website to his online ordering and make it a stunning experience for the guest and make that integrated perfectly with online ordering. So I start arguing with him over this call, like literally arguing with him as a 20 year old. I'm like, how could you say they don't need it? Like we've got all this evidence to support it. I, I went in feeling nervous, but now I was feeling like brave because I'm like, I've made it this far. I finally got the introduction. This is one of two people in this industry I want to work with. I need to make it work. And after like literally 30 minutes of arguing back and forth, I said to him, I think the reason you don't realize that restaurants need this is because you already built it yourself, but not everybody has millions of dollars and a decade of experience in the technology industry to build their own technology. The other 50% of the market, the mom and pop restaurant owners could really benefit from this. And <laughs> he said to me, you remind me of a past version of myself and I see your point. I think this could actually be very useful. So because you've stood your ground, I would love to be involved. I'll invest what you want me to invest. And I would love to bring you to Boulder, Colorado and show you what I've built in my restaurants so that you can use this technology to help the other restaurants that wouldn't otherwise have access to this. I want to talk about the, the inflection point in your career. So you're two years in and you get money. Yay. How did you transition yourself out of doing everything and having your hands in everything to focusing on your core competency, which you're best in the world at? My whole life changed when I learned that the team you build is the company you build. They are the same. A company is a team of people at its core. I used to think I had to be Iron Man, meaning the guy with the magic suit and a thousand helpers that are assembling every piece of that suit so that he could be the superhero that saves the day every time. And I think a lot of small business owners, my past self included, fall into that trap. When in fact, rather than trying to be Iron Man, we have to realize that we as business owners, if we're doing it right, are Nick Fury. Nick Fury doesn't have any incredible superpowers of his own, but his superpower is the ability to constantly be looking for people with their own superpowers to bring to this bigger mission of saving the world. Talk to me about that blueprint for restaurant marketing that works. So I will speak only in things that can be actioned without using our platform so that anybody that is listening can apply these things to their business, regardless of where they are, and use these things to grow their restaurant business based on the data that we've seen across thousands of restaurants about what actually works best to increase sales. The blueprint has multiple different parts to it from getting new customers. There's best practices there that we've now seen across thousands of restaurants patterns that we've noticed that all of the most successful ones in growing have in common. Then there's, after we get new customers, how do we make sure that the value of that customer to us is as high as possible, that they spend as much money as possible with us, which is a function of how much they spend on every order, the frequency at which they order, and how long that relationship with the customer lasts. Then after the getting new customers and making each customer worth as much money as possible, there's this third part of marketing, which I would describe as the artistic side. The first two are scientific. The third is very artistic because it's the part of marketing of branding. How do I make sure that my restaurant is appealing to the type of people that I want to serve? How do I strategically message it and create visuals around it in such a way that for the people that my restaurant 
is targeting really resonates with them. I, I think one of the struggles as, a, as an independent restaurateur is that you want to be everything to everyone. The most successful brands take a position. Mm -hmm. Not that they necessarily alienate, but they they have the courage to call out, these are my people, this is my tribe. People like us, to quote Seth Godin, people like us do these things. And so um, one of the things that, that I, I think is critical is that you take a position, right? Yes, exactly. We recently looked at the data for one of our top performing Indian restaurants on the platform. We expected them to be really everything to everybody, very affordable price point, super high quality food, perfect reviews. And then when we looked at who it was that was ordering most frequently by taking their customer list and uploading it to data enrichment platforms, we saw that their customer was a very specific female between the ages of 50 and 60 years old. And we then realized further that these were moms that were buying for their families. They saw Saffron Indian Kitchen, the restaurant that we looked at the data for, as the perfect concept to feed their family with a variety of flavors rather than just going with the usual family dinner in the East Coast. That was what they were buying Saffron Indian Kitchen for. And it was overwhelming how many of their top customers had this exact same profile. And without even realizing it at the time, that was what Rahul, the owner there, had built his brand around. It was what his messaging appealed to. It was what his menu appealed to. And so branding doesn't just have to be a happy accident, which happened in Rahul's case, because that is what who he was. Rather than thinking in the terms of how is this going to appeal to everybody, you start to ask yourself, how is this going to appeal to that specific person that I'm envisioning in my mind? And every different options for everything, that everything to everybody has already been taken. That's what Walmart does. That's what Amazon does. That's what McDonald's does. If you want to be really remembered by people, you have to choose instead to be something to somebody, something special. Everybody sold. Everybody listening is like, great, sounds great. And so they do the data research. Maybe they work with you. Maybe they work with someone else and they figure out who their target demo is. Yes. Then what's next? There's the artistic side of it, which we just covered, which is making sure that the language that you use on your menu or your website appeals to that person that you're trying to reach. The visuals of the place too should mirror what it is that somebody would expect from a restaurant that is great for feeding a family if you're a mom 50 to 60, which he has a more traditional, formal aesthetic to his restaurant, which perfectly appeals to this demographic. The other side though, that we ha have a lot of data on is the power of storytelling for brand, where Rahul on his website has a page that shares his story, that shares how he went from a kid in India that was really passionate about cooking to then becoming a very successful chef in India at many of the top restaurants and resorts, and how he then used that experience that was initially inspired by his family's recipes and then became this very successful commercial chef to immigrate to this country that he's always loved from afar but finally got to live in, the United States. And just writing it like that made his customers really excited about supporting him. There's this thing I noticed in now helping thousands of restaurants with this, quite literally, that restaurant owners often feel like their story isn't going to be that compelling. Like any story of starting a restaurant is super interesting to the average person and especially to the person that you're trying to serve because as entrepreneurs, we often underestimate just how interesting it is to get to be a business owner and to go through the journey of saving up enough money and going through the obstacles. And so when we share that journey in language that makes people understand the various buildups to finally opening the business and why it means so much to us, what ends up happening is they connect to that story and they begin to associate parts of themselves in different parts of that story and then love the brand that much more for it. So this is branding technically, but it also is the most powerful driver for increasing customer lifetime value. We as restaurant owners intuitively see this in the way that people act in our dining room. We go up and do table touches 
as a way to show them the owner's there and they care and they have a relationship with the owner. But then digitally, we don't. And as a result, when we start to do this, scale the table touch model, scale that connection to every guest, it ends up creating an effect where then customers feel that much more excited about supporting that brand. They think about it more frequently with those other associations they have to it. And that's branding simplified. Like people don't support businesses. They support people. People buy Teslas because they believe in what Elon Musk is trying to build, not because they want to buy an electric car. Because they want to buy an electric car, Chevy Volt does the same thing and it's much cheaper. Yes. So that being the case, storytelling, having a maniacal focus on getting your story out there, and not just your story, but the story of your community, the story of your team, why you're doing what you're doing to steal from Simon Sinek, um, I, I think is way more important than what you're actually doing because someone will always offer something of higher value um, from a pricing perspective, uh, from a, a ingredient perspective. Someone's always, always going to source more locally, right? Offer a more accessible price point. The only thing that is objective is you and your story and why people would connect with it. Like the power of this is crazy. I actually am not a natural self-promoter. Like this is the first podcast I've ever done. I don't naturally want to share my story with everybody that I meet. I'm actually pretty introverted by nature, believe it or not. But the reason I've had to increasingly get good at storytelling is I've realized that it is an important part of how I and the people around me perceive the world. I want to talk about awareness because awareness is a critical part of marketing. Um, in targeting independent restaurateurs, right? You've got to talk to a thousand people to close a thousand deals, mm -hmm. um, which is difficult, but it's the same for independent restaurants. What are the tools you've used that directly translate to the tools that you give to independent restaurateurs to breed that awareness? What's interesting about this answer is that the tools that we use are actually different from the tools that we've seen work best for restaurants. Because we as a business are now at this place where we're operating across the United States. We've got restaurants in almost every city. And as a result of that scale, are able to use marketing that is national in nature or global in nature. We've got a tremendous amount of people that visit our website from all across the world because we're a software product that can be used anywhere. But with restaurants, that is not true. They don't have a product that can be used anywhere. They have a product that in most cases is bought by people within a five mile radius of where the restaurant is located, 10 at most. And what that means is that while social media might be a great channel to market most businesses, mine included, it turns out it's actually not a great channel at all to market restaurants because of a few different reasons, but it starts with that global nature of the product for a product that can only be purchased when you are very local in the vast majority of cases. That is terrifying, right? Because that's, that's how most people choose to market. That's how they choose to breed awareness today. Provide me with the alternative. I've got an independent restaurant. I'm in a relatively small market. Let's call it secondary or tertiary market. How do I let people know I exist? Social media is what most restaurant owners use to try to market their businesses because they're told by all of the experts in the space that that is where the new customers are found. They hear about how TikTok is blowing up and Instagram is really massive. And they think to themselves, if I could just get a small portion of these thousands of people that are viewing my content to buy, that'll make it worth it. But then what happens is that those algorithms are also global in nature. When a video goes viral on TikTok, it's not going viral in your city, it's going viral all across the world, which means that those people that are seeing your restaurant's video of the beautiful quesadilla and craving it might actually want the food, but the problem is that they can't buy it from you. And so it doesn't end up being a good driver of new customer acquisition unless you have a national or global presence like Wendy's or Taco Bell or Chipotle, which are no surprise, the brands that are spending so much money in social media marketing. There's another major reason to understand before we get into what the solution of this is, which is that the intent of 
the person that is browsing social media is not to buy food from a restaurant. What they're on social media to do is entertain themselves. But if you compare this to what people are doing on Google and Yelp, which are the number one and number two sources of new customers that we see work for restaurants, the difference is that the people on Google and Yelp are already in that state of mind where they're searching for a restaurant and they just need to find their place at the right time to drive that decision. And because they have that intent in that moment, what ends up happening is this effect where because the people that are visiting the website are visiting it with such a high intent and the restaurant is then showing up at the top for people that are searching for their dishes or their restaurant type or restaurants near them, those people are already ready to buy and they just need to be convinced that this restaurant is the best option instead of being convinced to buy and feel like Indian food in the first place, which sometimes like the vast majority of the time people do not feel like it turns out. Um, and so that's why Google and Yelp are the number one and the number two customer acquisition sources that we see in restaurants. It is not Facebook. It is not Instagram. It is not TikTok. So if that doesn't work, what does? There is one way that I've seen using Facebook ads to make social media actually ROI positive, meaning it generates a positive return on investment when the money is put into that channel. And it's something that all of the big restaurant corporations do, but only the most savvy independent operators do, which is retargeting based on the customer journey. What that means is that even if you ace the conversion rate of your website and you score a 20%, as many of the restaurants that use our product have done through optimizing for that. The problem is that even if you're converting 20%, what happens to the other 80% of people that were in your area and visited your website and maybe went through the online ordering experience, but for whatever reason, didn't place the order and actually become a customer. And what happens is that for whatever reason in that process, they get distracted. Their phone rings, their wife calls their name, their dog starts barking, and they forget that they were there to place an order. And it's not because they hate the restaurant or decided against it. It's just because like people get distracted and forget in the moment. So what's so powerful about retargeting is it enables you on Facebook and Instagram using the Facebook ad platform to target people that have already visited your website. And more than that, you can target people that have visited your website and built up a cart of items, but didn't complete the checkout, cart abandonment retargeting. So when you get in front of people that have already visited your online ordering and visited your website, and you remind them to complete the process, it turns out that not only is it very cheap to do, but a lot of people do it. The reason it's cheap to do, by the way, is the way the Facebook ad pricing model works is they bill you per thousand impressions. It might just be 50 of them a month, but 50 extra orders a month ends up adding up when you consider the average online order, for example, $50. It's $2,500 in extra revenue for that audience, which will cost less than $100 to stay in front of. So that's why we see such massive retargeting return on investment when restaurants figure that out, but not on the various other forms of social media marketing. So we've talked about awareness and conversion. Right. And let's say that's 40% of the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? 60% of it is frequency, right? You've earned the customer. They're your customer. Now there's a massive opportunity to convince someone that already knows you, that already likes you, that already trusts you to come back. One of the things that I say time and time again to my clients is your number one job is to let people know that you exist. Your number two job is to remind them that you exist. So... Talk to me about customer frequency. I noticed that across the board, the most successful restaurants that were growing huge numbers were focusing more on increasing customer frequency, increasing order size, increasing the value of the customer ultimately, rather than constantly just being trying to acquire more customers. It's an important part of it. Like you said, it's 40%, but the other at least 60%, maybe the ratio is like 25, 75 in my mind, <laughs> is on the maximizing a value of existing customer relationships. So the best ways that we've seen across our data are email marketing and text message marketing, which most people, my old self included, think of, and they're like, that's a very old marketing channel. Email's been around since the late 90s. How is that going to be the highest ROI channel for restaurants? And it turns out that there's a way to use email with automations where you perfectly reach people at the part of the customer journey that they are in. So 
when somebody is not yet a customer, but maybe they sign up to your email list on your website because they're interested in learning more about your specials or menu items or whatever offer it is that you use on your website to collect that email, you can then send them a campaign that until they become a customer, gives them all the reasons why they should become a customer, shares that restaurant's story, talks about the most popular dishes, offers a coupon for 20% off the first online order through the app or website. And then once they become a new customer, the question is how do you make them become a regular? So there's a dedicated campaign for that, turning new customers into regulars by automating emails and text messages that notice that they became a new customer. And now we're trying to increase the order frequency, which is how we define a regular, somebody that orders often and that orders for a very long period of time. And so then there's a campaign after they've become a regular that ensures they stay a regular. This is what we call the customer revival campaign. And that is constantly looking at a regular's ordering habits and making sure that if they stop ordering, that we quickly get in front of them with a series of emails and text messages, which are going to remind them of the restaurant. Because we've all had that experience of being a restaurant customer where we love a restaurant and there's nothing wrong with it. But for whatever reason, our routine one day gets interrupted and we kind of forget about it. And then we stop ordering from that restaurant. And it's not that we hate them. It's not that we don't like the food. We actually love it still, but it fell out of our routine and therefore we stopped going. And therefore it's been like six months and oh my gosh, do you remember that place? Everyone listening is thinking the same thing. I don't want to bother people. I'm in the hospitality industry. Nobody wants to hear from a restaurant. They don't want me to text them. They don't want me to email them. They're getting enough spam as is. How do we create messaging that increases the perceived value of the restaurant without annoying people? The reason most people feel that way is they think of that restaurant that is constantly telling them the same thing over and over and over again that could not be more irrelevant to their life, which is check out this beautiful picture of food and click here to order now or make a reservation. Customers should feel like they're getting a great deal and VIP status through being subscribed to those emails. That's sometimes giving them coupons off. Sometimes it's limited specials that you can only get on the email list. Sometimes it's events that they have access to or that they can be the first people to have access to. It's making them feel like they're a VIP for being subscribed to the email list and not just a victim of spam, which is the way most restaurants run their restaurant lists. 100%. There's this formula that I, I use and it proves successful year after year. And it's, you start with context, right? I'm sending you this email for this reason. So at the very top, they can either continue reading or they can delete it. And then we would offer value, like you're saying in real concrete terms. Here's a recipe from Dead Stock. This was one of, you know, the best uh, dishes we had in 2021. And uh, it's no longer on the menu. People are very much interested in what we do for a living. Yes. What I have found most effective is a singular call to action. I sent you this email for this reason. Do this thing. I think so often we fail to clearly define what winning looks like in the mind of the customer through the, the, the lens of our restaurant. You can't make the customer think about what to do next or they won't. They're so busy in their day when they're opening that email or opening that text message that it has to be clear as day what to do after you share the information. Some emails, like emails to increase online ordering sales, need calls to action. That's what our data shows. But there are other emails where we're not trying to drive that customer to a sale instantly because when somebody emails you multiple times a month and they're constantly trying to drive you to a sale, it feels like you're being spammed. So some emails have to be talking about the, like you described, experience of running the restaurant. People are often very curious to learn more about the recipes of the most popular dishes, for example, because people love cooking. And the story behind them even, like Rahul's stories from India about how his family made these specific curry dishes and why they did them in that way. Like learning that from Rahul and then having the recipe from this masterful chef is awesome. That is a great value add to, again, his customer, which he's defined as 50 to 60 year old women. And it's not just behind the scenes looks at the restaurant, it's also the story that led to the restaurant. So it ends up creating this effect where people not only love the business, but they love the people behind the business because it's not, here's my story, buy my chicken Parmesan, it's here's my story. I'm so glad that you're a customer, I'm grateful for you. I've worked so hard to have this restaurant and getting to serve you is why I do it. And that is a more powerful message in driving sales over the long term, even if it doesn't drive that short-term sales. What should we steal from you? 
like if we were to chunk this whole conversation up, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, there are a bunch of entrepreneurs listening to us. What tactics, tools, and strategies have you developed over the years that work regardless of industry? I would focus on the things that we've seen work best for growing restaurants, which is going to be the most relevant to the people on this podcast because everybody in the restaurant industry is constantly trying to find ways to grow sales profitably without losing money on every order, which is what happens with the third-party delivery app trend. And the best tools for doing that are Google SEO for acquiring new customers because when you can show up at the top of Google, when people have that intent to buy and are really looking for exactly what is on your menu, they're so much easier to convert into a customer that then is happy with you than if you're constantly having to like bombard them on Facebook with pictures of your dishes to hope that they crave it one day. That is the best way to get new customers. I would definitely recommend stealing that from us. You don't need anything from our platform to do it. I actually made a free video on YouTube that people can check out called SEO for restaurants, which has thousands of views where I break down the different parts of this and, and how restaurants can apply it independently. The second thing is after we've acquired those new customers, which Google is going to be the single best channel for, how do we ensure that the customers have as much value as possible to us? And the answer there is the automated marketing. We've seen that work best. And again, it doesn't have to be done through our platform. It's one of the ways to do it, but there's also other platforms that people can use if they prefer. Some point of sale systems like Toast offer basic versions of this. And what that looks like is ensuring that customers get the right message at the right time. I would say that is what I'm really proud to have developed at Owner over the past six years. We don't just give the tools to do the job. We give the proven templates, which are working to get the job done across thousands of other restaurants, whether that's the right campaign for driving up customer frequency or the right campaign for turning website visitors into new customers. We've got the right email and text message marketing campaigns to achieve each of those objectives. And we're constantly making them better by running tests. So that is what I'd recommend doing for maximizing customer lifetime value. Then the third part is branding. This one, I have an upcoming video coming out on YouTube if people want to check out my channel. I just started it, but it's starting to, to really take off, which I'm excited about. Um, and that video is breaking down the different steps that are involved in creating a compelling brand that works. So it's gonna come out in a few weeks if people wanna to subscribe to the channel, it'll give you a notification, totally free. But that is the, the framework that I'd describe, which basically expands on what we've discussed here today about building a successful brand by first starting with who it is that you're trying to appeal to and then figuring out the right associations and feelings that you wanna evoke in them and how to strategically go about designing your experience to achieve those things. It's super easy to look at your life and to look at your career and see it as this meteoric, like rocket-like trajectory where it's been nothing but good news since the day you started the company. Um, and I think that it's useful for the restaurateurs listening and entrepreneurs in general to hear that it wasn't always a rosy path and that you, like so many of us, came so close to losing what we worked so hard to build time and time again. Talk to me about the struggles you've experienced as an entrepreneur growing this business and how you were able to overcome those obstacles. The real story is that this has been one of the most challenging journey that I've heard even in studying other startups stories. Because when I started, I first of all was a high school dropout that knew nobody in the tech world. And so for the first two and a half years of building this business, had to do it completely bootstrapped. And in that two and a half year period, there were literally thousands of rejections, rejections from all different types of people, rejections from customers that I was trying to get the attention of, actually cold calling and walking into their restaurants and trying to talk to them about the solution I was building and having doors literally slammed in my face or being yelled at. And then all of these small stories pale in comparison to what happened during the pandemic because that was two and a half years in to building this business. Dine in is how our business was designed. And so that's what the entire first two and a half years of this company was focused around. It was a website builder that drove Dine in, which was brutal when in that third week of March, we got the news as a country that all the dining rooms in this country would be locked down because it meant that the customers that I just spent two and a half years building relationships with 
and perfecting the product for that were funding the business all in the course of two weeks couldn't pay us. And that meant not only did we have to do layoffs and get down to just two people in the company, but a bunch of other stuff was, was going wrong during this period. I could either choose to interpret this as something that was happening to me, which was my initial interpretation, or I could choose to believe that this was happening for me and that this was a part of God's plan for my life. And that if I could just find a way to adapt to this circumstance, that I could end up stronger on the other side. So with the few months of cash left and me and one other person in the company started quickly and intensely trying to figure out how we could pivot our business model to actually work in the pandemic. And we started talking to all of our previous customers and asking them what it was that their biggest challenges were and what their biggest frustrations were. And the thing that they kept screaming into the phone over and over and over again was how DoorDash was taking 30% of every transaction in this industry where profit margins are just 5% and how they're also taking all the customer relationships from the restaurant. And unless I find a solution to this, Adam, I don't think I'm going to make it because my entire business has become online ordering focused and we're losing money this way. We need to find a way to take direct online orders from our website. So that was what I hoped was a light bulb moment. And for the next four months, intensely hacked on building that project, on adding in an online ordering element to our platform, hoping that this was the way to survive. Because if it wasn't, it was over. I was going to lose the two and a half years of dedicating every waking moment to this company. And then thank God, it really worked. We launched it in May, like weeks away from running out of cash, praying to God that this thing takes off. And just 10 months later, it went from zero customers, zero revenue, about to be zero dollars in the bank account, to thousands of customers, millions in revenue, over $10 million in venture raised from all those famous names that you just described. In entrepreneurship, there's never a shortage of challenges and those moments are bound to reoccur where it feels like the entire business is on fire and unless you put it out quickly, it's all going to burn down. But unless you can constantly bring that mindset to it, what happens is it does burn down. You and I have something big in common in the way that we both serve independent restaurateurs, owners and operators. Do you have any advice or words of encouragement for the tens of thousands of people that are listening that are hoping to better their lives and their businesses? One of the things that I often said to myself in all of the difficult periods of building this company is that the biggest superpower that I could have is not being willing to quit regardless of how difficult or painful it got, which there were so many different moments, which we haven't even gone into where the business looked like it could potentially go under, or there was all these things that were incredibly embarrassing and painful to go through. And in those moments, there was a feeling in my gut of like, is this even worth it? Is it worth pushing through this? Um, because the odds in many of those cases looked like they were stacked against us. It didn't look like the business was going to survive anyway. So why would I endure like months or in one case years of like pushing through to get there? And thank God, like I literally think this came from God. I just had that resonating in my head that the biggest superpower I could have is not being willing to quit. And that if I persevered through any obstacle, which came up in this entrepreneurial journey, that I'd be able to survive because entrepreneurship in many ways is a pain contest. We're constantly being tested for how much pain we can endure at any given point. And it gets harder as the company gets bigger. It doesn't get easier. And unless you have that mentality, sometimes the pain feels unbearable. But when you have that mentality, you can find meaning in it. 